sex. Best-selling author Mo Isom says everyone's talking about it, except the church. She joins us live for a candid conversation about virginity, promiscuity, and everything in between on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Here's something you don't see every day. 13 semi-trucks lined up across a freeway in the middle of the night. And here's why this picture has gone viral. At about 1 a.m. last Tuesday, the Michigan State Police received a call that a man was hanging off the side of a bridge on Interstate 696 in Detroit. The unidentified man was threatening to end his life by jumping onto the freeway. Officers quickly sprang into action. First, they closed the eastbound and westbound lanes. Next, 13 trucks waiting on both sides of the highway were waved through the line, and officers had them line up under the bridge in order to shorten the fall if the man did jump. Well, the truckers sat there for about two hours as negotiators talked to the man, and then thankfully the man did not jump, and he walked away safely. He was taken to a local hospital by the police, and uh, that's a wonderful thing for the truckers to do, to you know, say, let's save a life today. They're often so gracious on the road that I see when traffic is heavy and they're trying to just kind of help facilitate things, but this was life-saving. This was pretty wonderful. And we should be equally gracious back to them, because yes. they've got a big yeah. truck. Oh, mercy, yes. <laughs> Well, even though an EF3 tornado tore through their town, many residents of Elon, Virginia, are still giving thanks and praise to God. On Sunday, April 15th, the storm left a path of destruction, destroying 26 homes on Nottaway Drive. Thankfully, no one was killed. Gary Fink and his wife and five children hid, their, hid in their basement during the tornado, and now all that's left of their home is the foundation. Where the Fink home once stood, neighbors recently gathered to sing praises to God. In a Facebook Live video, 17-year-old Trey Tyree, who lives across the street from the Finks, stands on the bare foundation of the Fink home and with guitar in hand leads his neighbors in the popular Casting Crown song, Praise You in This Storm. I was sure by now, God. Would have reached down, wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen. As your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. I'll praise you in this storm and I will lift my hand For you are who you are That's true praise We can praise him in the middle of the storm uh, To praise him just as Job did The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away Blessed be the name of the Lord Yeah, And what a miracle when you see that destruction That nobody died No one that. died, yeah Amazing, <laughs> amazing well, nearly 3,000 years ago, Hebrew prophets wrote of how the land of Israel would be transformed. Now a new book shows remarkable and even prophetic changes in the 70 years since Israel became a nation. Chris Mitchell explains from Jerusalem. 150 years ago, famed author Mark Twain visited the Holy Land and wrote, It was a desolate country and a silent and mournful expanse. He talks about up in the Jezreel Valley, he talks about how that you can travel in 10 miles in any direction and not see a single person. And so one of the, one of the towns that, that we did some photography was of a small town of Afula, which you know, is really off the map as far as many Westerners are concerned, but it was established in the early 1900s. So 50, 60 years after Mark Twain, there's a small Jewish settlement. And today it's a booming Israeli city that we've been able to match some side-by-side -side perfect photography with it. Doug Hershey and his team chose 200 photographs of Israel from the 1880s to the 1940s. In his new book, Israel Rising, The Land of Israel Reawakens, Hershey chronicles the changes from that time span until today. That's been part of the joy. I mean, we have these old photos of Tel Aviv of less than 100 years ago of shacks on sand dunes with camel caravans on the beach. And to compare it from the exact same angle today, it's just stunning. The book follows Ezekiel's promise where in chapter 36, verse 8, the prophet declared, But you, O mountains of Israel, 
You shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. We think of prophecy being to kings or to people or nations, but he's prophesying to the land that when Israel returns as a nation, branches will put forth fruit, uh, waste cities will be rebuilt, the people will be, uh, people and beasts will be multiplied on the land, the land will be cultivated and sown. These side-by-side -side photos show the transformations. Here's Jerusalem near the King David Hotel in the 1930s, and the same view today. This is the Hebrew University campus in 1925, and what it looks like now. From the north in Haifa to the south in Beersheba, Hershey says the pictures represent the prophet's words coming alive. We're living in a really profound time in history. We're living in a time where 26, 2700 year old prophecies from, from Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they've been lying dormant for about that long and many of them are coming to pass. The most repeated promise through, through the scriptures is that God will bring his people back to the land and when they do, there's gonna be these dramatic changes and we're seeing those. Hershey says the land itself seemed to be waiting for its ancient people to return. To me, it's one of the most profound things here is this land has been conquered you know, 15, 20 different times. It never becomes a homeland for any other people group. And the land would never produce for any other people group. And Israel moves back in and suddenly the vast desert wastelands are now producing flowers, they're producing fruit. Isaiah 27 talks about how that when uh, Israel returns, Jacob will take root and fill the earth with fruit. And for many centuries, believers would read that and look at that as allegorical or spiritual. And we're finding today, it's very literal. It's happening right now. Hershey says the book provides a visual opportunity for those who have never visited Israel. And it's also struck a chord with the younger generations. Most millennials are ready for something real. They want to see something practical. It's as far as the much of, of um, perhaps theological Christianity that they've been raised on more ideas. Uh, they're ready for something solid. They're ready for something real. And so even now when I, when I speak in the States, sometimes I'll have questions about theology or the questions about the land. And usually my answer revolves around, let me show you. you know, come with me to Israel, I'll show you myself. As Israel celebrates its 70th anniversary, Hershey sees Israel as a miracle. Absolutely, I mean, that's, Israel is, is the time clock as many people have, have heard and have said. And I believe that as well. I mean, there's so much that is happening here in a very short amount of time. To me, it's one of the most profound miracles of our day. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, the desert is blooming and it's wonderful to see. If you want to see more of Israel's miraculous journey from unforgiving desert land to a thriving nation, uh, get a copy of Doug Hershey's new book. It's called Israel Rising and it's available wherever books are sold. And Terry, I mean, it's real stark to see the oh, pictures and when you start understanding Tel Aviv was literally built on sand dunes by the Mediterranean out of nothing. And now the vibrant metropolis, uh, it's cosmopolitan. It's prophecy on paper, come to yeah, pass. It's, just, it's remarkable to it see. It is remarkable. Even though you know that it's happened, to see that is the completion, the fulfillment of what was spoken. Wow, that's pretty powerful. Well, coming up, a former All-American goalkeeper for LSU and the first female ever to try out and train for a Division I men's football team. Now a speaker and best-selling author, Mo Isom, joins us live to talk about sex, Jesus, and the conversations the church forgot. Mo Isom is not defined by her sexual past, but she believes the time has come to talk about it and to ask the question, in a world obsessed with sex, why is the church relatively silent about it? Take a look. We need to talk. We need to talk about sex, lust, perfect bodies, masturbation, porn. We even have websites for adultery. We're obsessed with sex, drowning in temptation. Sex is in the open, but our shame must be kept hidden. Because even though we're surrounded by it, nobody wants to talk about it. We need to talk. The church, we're looking like hypocrites because we're often silent or worse, misguided. Sure, I had virginity vows, but that didn't stop me from pornography, which led to promiscuity, and nobody told me that my bondage would follow me into marriage. The outside churched girl looked good, but behind closed doors, that was a different story. 
Mo Isom joins me now. Mo, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. You know, as I listen to what you share in that video, you know, so much of anything that's sexual, that's shameful, mm -hmm. stays behind closed doors. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm assuming that's the reason for this. It's the heart of the book. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This, um, I desired deeply to pour out my mess. Yeah. And the power of the redemption that Jesus offers us, no matter what our sexual past looks like, yes. in order to catalyst this conversation. Because yeah. there's important things that we need to be first off understanding in our own hearts and then impacting the culture with and speaking truth into. Well, and impacting the church because the things you're talking about are not just out there in the world somewhere. They're yeah. right within the four walls of the church. Yep. Yeah. It's so startling. Before we go further with that, talk a little bit about how this started for you. Go back to when you were nine years old. What happened in your life? Yes, I um, was was brought up by you know wonderful God fearing parents who worked to speak truth into me um, in that capacity, but. Um, conversations were kind of incomplete. There was a lot of talk about virginity, but not truly purity. And then at, at nine years old, I came across um, pornography mm. from my dad's, yeah. you know, belongings. And that seared something in me, even just the sight of it. And it became something I didn't run from in shame. I actually had great curiosity about and sought out. And pornography um, became a struggle for me for a decade, which also sort of desensitized me and led into promiscuity and acting things out that I saw and saw as powerful and beautiful and all the things our world sort of declares around sex. So how did Jesus redefine you? Because honestly, you kind of get, when we, when we are surrounded by that and then immersed in it, and then it, it actually gets into us, it changes the, our image. We're made in the image and likeness of God, but it changes our image. How did Jesus then re-sculpt your image for you? Yes, sexual sin so dehumanizes us and it dehumanizes others in our sight. It's how we can look at porn and see it as body parts rather than image bearing creations of God. Oh. Um, but what's so amazing is that, that Christ's incredible compassion and mercy, when he intersected my life, I was radically changed, just my, brought from death to life. Um, and my prayer became, okay, God, break my heart for what breaks yours and bind my heart to thee. Give me eyes to see the world as you do. Give me, give me ears to hear the cries of the hurting. And what was so incredible in that simple prayer, and I would challenge everyone watching to pray that, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Give me eyes to see the world as you do. My vision began to change. I began to see the ways we had taken this beautiful gift he's given us and twisted it and cheapened it and perverted it and worshiped it, really. Um, and I began to see myself as a, a new creation understand whose I was and understand the beautiful ways that he desired to redeem that brokenness and redeem those, those pieces that I had given of myself away and redeem my misunderstandings or my misguidance about sex. It's actually why Jesus came. Yep. yep. You mentioned just a second ago, virginity versus purity. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I certainly don't want to fault conversations of virginity because it's an important thing. Sure. But when we don't go deeper in understanding what God truly cares most about our heart condition, we lead people towards behavior modification versus heart transformation. And God always cares most passionately about the heart. It is, it is you know, impure actions come out of an impure heart, pure actions from a pure heart. And so I understood a lot about virginity, but we're sinners and I wanted to rationalize and I wanted to understand, okay, then what's, what counts? How far is too far? How far can I go? Am I still a virgin? And when I came to know Christ, there was just this reckoning of, of, I don't want a, a works-based answer to a life surrender question. I want all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. And, mm -hmm. um, I care deeply for the condition of your heart, yeah. not just, you know, what symptomatic, Mm -hmm. you know, outpouring what your life looks like. If, if we can allow God to do the heart work in us, virginity becomes a beautiful byproduct. Yes. And living a pure life becomes an outpouring, a byproduct, not the sole rule following focus, but a surrendered life mm -hmm. that, that that is a result of. Yeah. Many of these 
these ideas and thoughts and, and um, understandings came to you before you were married, you had little, little idea that some of the pain of the past would come with you into your marriage. How yes. did that impact you? You know, I think it's it's interesting because we often believe if I stand at the altar and I say I do, my sexual testimony is done. It's all the past. And um, what actually happens, I think that the enemy, my sister told me a great quote. She said, prior to marriage, the enemy will do everything he can to drive us together. After marriage, he'll do everything he can to drive us apart. And that means using brokenness from our past, shame, guilt, unrepentant sin, things that we're still carrying, he'll use it to confuse us in marriage. Um, it also means these kind of false expectations yes. that I talk about in the book, yes. um, these misunderstandings about sex as a whole. Well, he'll our use whole those. Culture, our whole culture saturates people with that, kids Inundated. with that. Yep. Kids with that. Yes, the culture has a lot to say about sex. In fact, it's the loudest thing we scream about. It's everywhere. And yet there's no great source of that understanding. There's no great source of what we're taught. It's sort of a Pandora's box of, yes. you know, lots of different thoughts and ideas. And when we can come back to the source, the truth, the word of God, we can see that God has a lot to say about sex. In fact, He's the one who invented it. Then why it doesn't the gift. church say more about it? If, if God says it That's and the I'm instruction book is where we're to learn, what yeah. should the church be saying about it? You know, honestly, I think we as the church, the body of believers as a whole, we have got to step up and reclaim sex for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. and, and where that begins is we've got to reckon with and wrestle through the, the issues in our own hearts. Yeah. We personally need to understand the fullness of what God says about sex and the incredible power of who Jesus is in light of our sexual mm -hmm. sin. This is the Jesus who sat with the whore at the well and offered her living water. This is the Jesus who saw the adulteress to be stoned and didn't condemn her, but said in response to my great love, go and sin no more. This is the God who uses Rahab the prostitute in the lineage of, in the, of lineage the Messiah. Of Jesus. Yes. And so, so God has a lot to say about redemption there too. We must come to know that healing and wholeness in our heart. And then we have to step past this taboo feeling, this uncomfortable feeling, this shame that we've often been, you know, silenced by. We must be bold and courageous, yes. empowered by the Holy Spirit to boast in our weaknesses so that we can point to the glory of the yeah. cross. When we as the church can rise up and say, we're wrestling and struggling with this too. I think it sends an invitation to a world that's an undated by it to say, okay, they're not just the puffed up and pretty people behind those four walls. They're human just like me. And so who is the answer to my human struggles? And, and what is truth in light of all of this I'm wrestling with? It's such an important and significant subject in our world today, not just for all of us as grown-ups, but for our children. Yes. Mo's book is called Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations the Church Forgot. It's available wherever books are sold. It's a must read for everyone who's a believer and those who are not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mo, thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Great to have you here. My pleasure. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a Muslim man's children are tormented by evil spirits for four years. They started making sketches, really scary faces with red eyes. They kept saying, you know, they came to our bed and they started shaking my kid. He was in the bed and he was throwing fists. He was sitting in his bed and screaming. See who he turned to for help. Don't go away. When a Muslim man named Ishmael began dabbling in the occult, demonic spirits began tormenting his children. This went on for four long years until he experienced a supernatural encounter with Jesus. According to the latest census, Muslim population in Australia has soared to more than 600,000 people, making Islam the most popular and fast-growing non-Christian religion in the country. But while extreme Islamization poses a threat to Australian society, there are Muslims who have made decisions to leave their religion and embrace Christianity. We hear of many stories all around the world of Muslims converting to Christianity through dreams and visions. Here in Australia, we met a Muslim man whose family was tormented by the devil until he experienced a supernatural encounter with Jesus. 
Ismail is a Turkish Muslim. He migrated to Australia when he was 19. Although he practiced Islam, he considered himself a moderate Muslim because he always had questions about God and Islam. I wanted to know the unknown about God, about the spiritual realms, about, you know, is, is witchcraft from God or is it from the devil? In his search for answers, he got involved with the occult, not knowing that he opened himself to demonic spirits. He met a Turkish Muslim who called spirits using the Ouija board and a coffee cup. Ismail continued with this activity with the spirit world until the manifestations of the devil became more and more frightening. We are making uh, coffee. I'm making my own coffee, he's making his own coffee. So I'm stirring the coffee and I'm looking at the coffee cup and I'm seeing this creature in this coffee. On the last day when I actually was leaving his house, he said, look, two of them are going with you. For four years, Ismail's two sons were tormented by the devil. They started making sketches, scary, really scary faces with red eyes. They kept saying, you know, they came to our bed and they started, you know, shaking my kid. He was in the bed and he was literally like with his fist, he was throwing fists. He was sitting in his bed and screaming. 10, 15, 20 minutes, I can't remember. He, we were not able to wake him up. We still couldn't wake him up. So we, I laid him down flat and I said, what's going, what's, what's happening? He's still there, he still didn't wake up. I freaked out. Out of his frustration, he sought the help of his Iranian Christian friend who brought him to a Bible study. Here, he surrendered his life to Jesus. And then I'm seeing this figure. <laughs> He's holding his hands up like this towards me. And uh, I could tell he's smiling. I could not, I, all I was seeing was just this light coming everywhere. It just was amazing. And uh, I actually, yeah, fall in love with him. And that's how I converted. The pastor instructed Ismail to pray for two weeks, commanding the demons to leave their home. Every night I was praying, I was saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have no authority here. Your demons leave in Jesus' name. His children stopped having nightmares. Since then, Ismail hungered for the Word and began reading the Bible. He compared what the Bible said with the teachings in the Quran. There is nowhere in the book, nobody can find anywhere, where Allah says, if you do this, you will go to heaven. There is only one way, and that is if you get martyred, and in the way of jihad. I know now the truth. Jesus is as real as you and me. He has created us, and only through His blood we can come to the God the Father, and He is an amazing, compassionate, graceful, forgiving God. And He will be graceful, graceful, compassionate, a forgiving God, He will be that for you if you just let Him. Here's an incredible encounter with a living Savior who showed Himself strong and then gave Him the faith He needed to get rid of those oppressing spirits. Uh, just imagine your children being tormented that way in their sleep at night. And He brought peace to their house because He is the King of Peace. Peace, the Prince of Peace. If you want this, if you want to know Him uh, and, and no longer get a, get a view that somehow He's a mean God or He's angry with you or you haven't checked all the right boxes or done all the right things, realize that He is pursuing you and He wants you to have, have that same peace, that same righteousness, peace, and joy. How do you do it? How do you get it? You ask for it. And it's very simple, very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're real, if you really are there, if you really are my, my Messiah, could you show me? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer. 
He'll be there for you. What he's done for others, he will do for you. If you want to help with that prayer, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. We'd be glad to pray for you and give you a free packet called A New Day, What Christians Believe and How to Live the Christian Life. It's all free, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins.